fourth verse of the song.
Will you bear with me, please? Our most gracious Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for this day, this beautiful day you've given us, Father, to come together here, Father, to study another portion of your word and sing songs to you, Father, that you're only worthy of, Father. This time, Father, we would pray that you would be with the number, our number, Father, that could not be here today because of health and sickness, Father. We pray that you would be with them and give them the help that they once had, Father. And especially pray that you would be with all of our number that have uh, upcoming surgeries, Father. Pray that you'd be with them and the doctors ministering to them. We've had many, Father, that have surgeries in, in recovery, Father. We pray that you would be with them and give them an easy or quick, quick, uh, get wellness, Father. Pray that you would be with Rick tonight. Give him an easy recollection of the lessons he studied, Father. And pray that you would be with us as listeners to understand your word better, Father, that we could teach other people and they could become your children. Pray, Father, that you would go with us through the rest of this service, Father, and God guard and direct us. See us home safely, Father, and see us back at the next appointed time. And as we pray in your Son's holy name, amen. Number 881. Good evening. We're glad you're here this evening. We hope you've had a good afternoon. I know the young people had an exciting afternoon, um, about three hours of eating and playing and uh, being together, and it was a wonderful time that they enjoyed. And speaking of our young people, they're um, going to be those that can uh, um, involved in an activity next Sunday of delivering um, food. Let's just leave it there food to some folks that could use it and it's been requested if you would like to to donate to that effort just get a hold of uh, Kyle or Megan or talk to me or Paul and um, they'll fill you in on about it but uh, we'll just leave that right there if you'd like to help with that effort just let them know I know it's time of year where there's a lot of needs but they're going to reach out for one that's uh, pretty special so if you can help them let them know. Also, I want to remind you, if you look on the doors going in and out, you'll see this hanging. These are available for you to put in your car.
cards he might be mailing out this time of year, also to be giving these away wherever you go or hanging them on doors. And these are cards that point to over 1,500 videos of gospel teaching. And so people can access these videos by utilizing the the scan on here or just going to the website. So way to evangelize. All you got to do is just leave it for somebody to pick it up. So please take advantage of those. We've got plenty. There's more uh, if we run out from what we've got back there in the foyer. Tonight I'd like you to take your Bibles out and turn with me to Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. We're going to be talking uh, again about the thousand-year reign in reference to Satan being bound. And as we put forth this morning, there's always that question, if Satan is bound, why am I so plagued with the devil? Well, we're going to deal with that question and also with answers as we look at carefully what has been revealed in Revelation chapter 20 as well as some very other important passages of Scripture. So let's begin looking at verse 1, just as a reminder. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. Now, as we read, I'm going to try to be careful not to, to, to read anything into this that's not there because we, this is one book we're warned in chapter 22 we don't add to or take away from. And Satan is the one who has deceived man from the very beginning by adding to and taking away. And we have that warning. So we don't want to do that. We want to look carefully at what it says and remember that man can add to and take away. And people can fall victims to false teaching because of that adding to or taking away. And so as we go through this, if you feel like I've added to or taken away, you make sure and let me know. Because I don't want to do that. I don't want to be accountable for that. I want to be accountable for the truth. So I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. A great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now, we are dealing with a book that is a book written in the form of like Daniel and Ezekiel, giving us through word pictures information that allows us to understand many things, including the fact that in the end, God's people win. And that is important. Satan is not going to win. It might seem for a while like he's victorious, but no, he's not going to win. And as you look at the description here, and the idea that he is bound for a thousand years, it's important to understand that the thousand years is definitely a long period of time. Now, I have here what is known as the premium view. We've shown this slide several times on the screen. And this is what is commonly taught in relationship to Revelation chapter 20. But the question we must be asking ourselves is what we're seeing here the truth. Well, as you look at it, you're going to see that there's some things added that aren't in Revelation 20. Also, you're going to see the relative nature of this time period and what happens. And one of the things that's outstanding as you hear this discussed and taught by people on radio, TV, and in books is they talk about Christ's reign on earth for a thousand years. But as you look at Revelation 20, we don't read the, those words. What do we read? We read that those who were beheaded reign with Christ for a thousand years. And where are the souls of those who die in the Lord? Well, we already have looked at that just as Jesus told the thief on the cross, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Where did Lazarus go? He was found in Abraham's bosom. Revelation reveals that it's under the altars. We've pointed out earlier in our previous studies. They reign with Christ. It doesn't say Christ comes back and reigns here or that even Christ reigns. It speaks of the reign, as you look down particularly in verses 5 and following, the reign is the beheaded 
for the witness and testimony of Christ, those live and reign with Christ. That's the essential thing. And that's where things start to go wrong. And so as we look at the amillennial view, you have the millennium period starting with Christ and the preaching of the cross when the church and the kingdom was established. And we know from Mark 9, 1 that the kingdom was established because Jesus told the disciples that some of them would, that uh, were alive would see the kingdom of God coming from power. We know when we're baptized, we're translated out of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. And so the church and the kingdom age is that period of time that we have in context with those who were beheaded. When were they beheaded? In the first century. And there would be more to, that would be beheaded to follow from the writing of Revelation chapter 20. And so we have this period of time which it speaks of the, those who would lose their lives for Christ. What happens when a person dies because they've been persecuted in some foreign country or even in America? Well, what happens to a Christian when they die? They reign with who? Christ. And that's significant. So, verse 4, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast nor his image, and not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. A thousand years a long period of time. But it's a specific long period of time. It's a time in which they are reigning with Christ. Those who had been beheaded. They're the souls who live and reign with Christ. So this brings us back to the devil. The one who is bound. And that's where the questions begin to abound. With the one who is bound. I worked hard on that statement, so y'all go ahead and smile. It's okay. Yes, Satan is bound and cast into the bottomless pit, shut up, and a seal was set on him. So he is the one who is shut up. And this place that we have recorded here is the home of the sinful. Look at Second Peter 2, verse 4. If God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them to, into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So what do we know about this place of fire and brimstone? It is a place of reservation, home of the sinful angels and Satan. But... We go to this question that keeps nagging people, and I've heard people express this. If, if, if Satan is bound, then why am I plagued with Satan? Well, if Satan bound, how is it that the devil is still at work? Why am I being tempted? Does the binding of Satan that we read about in Revelation chapter 20 even speak of the fact that they, the devil has no effect on us today? Or we're not plagued by the devil? Those are good questions. So those are questions that deserve an answer. And I want to start tonight in this lesson, in looking for an answer, is to answer the question, who's the devil? Well, Revelation 20, verse 2 tells us, he laid hold on the dragon, the serpent of old. When you hear that, what does your mind go to? Well, the serpent of old. Who was it? Remember the garden? Yes, we remember. The serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, he is the one bound. And that is clear in Scripture in Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to woman. You know, most people run from snakes, don't they? But I guarantee if one's talking to me, I'm leaving. Right? And then we should. Why? Look what the, he said to the woman. Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Of course, she answered that, and he told her she shall not surely die. He added to God's word. Now, we also learn from Revelation, and if you want to turn to chapter 12, we want to look at that tonight, because we have information about the devil, Satan. And here we learn about this great dragon who was cast out 
that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. And what is the work of that serpent? Deceiving what? The whole world. It's interesting that the ancient Greeks classified a dragon as a type of serpent, but one that was believed to have incredible sight so they could spot their prey. And that's significant, isn't it? When you think about a, this one called the devil and Satan having eyes that can spot the prey. Go back to verse 1, Revelation 12. Let's pick up the context because we have that dragon revealed significantly. There was a great sign, verse 1, that appeared in heaven. We'll pick up the verse. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head, and a, a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. Then go to verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about ready to give birth to devour. And look at this. Her child as soon as it was born. What child did Satan want out of the picture from the very beginning of birth. What birth was significant to the salvation of man? Well, look at verse 5. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. What male child is king of kings and lord of lords? What male child was prophesied to rule with a rod of iron? What child came to this earth and then was caught up into heaven that Satan wanted to stop? I think everyone knows that answer. Then verse 6 tells us that that woman fled into the wilderness where she was at a place there where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there, and notice this, it's not 1,000 years, it's 1,260 days, so this is a shorter period of time. And then we go on in verse 7, look at this, and war broke out in heaven. Sometimes people go back and put this before Genesis 1, that's not what we're reading here, and that's significant. When heaven describes a war, it's telling us that something important happened. And of course, we know in a spiritual way. And so look at this and think about this war that broke out in heaven not being prior to Genesis 1. And the war broke out in heaven. Michael, is our, er, er, Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. What did the dragon want? The baby was not successful. So was the war over when the baby was able to be born on, in this earth and then be taken up into heaven? When Acts 1 occurred, was the war over with Christ and his work and the disciples, the apostles? No. But look what we have. Michael's angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. We read on. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now. And as I read this, I want you to think Acts chapter 2. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come, Christ as the anointed one. What happened after Jesus was taken up into heaven? Man was blessed. In Acts chapter 2, with the preaching of the gospel, salvation was brought to men, and there was a strength that came from God that was not known before. And what was established with the preaching of the gospel? The kingdom of our God 
And there's power, as we know, in what? We sing that song, power in the blood. And who made it possible? That sacrificial lamb. Verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, and there's the verse, then it follows, For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. What happened to Satan when Jesus was resurrected? What happened when the gospel was preached? Was there freedom from Satan in the sense that he could accuse, but he didn't win if that person was faithful? Of course. And as you think about the work of Satan, he wanted man with him and destroyed from being obedient. In fact, it's interesting that the word Satan means enemy, adversary, and accuser. He was the accuser of our brethren, John writes under inspiration. What did he want? He wanted the church destroyed. He wanted the effectiveness of Christ annulled. He didn't want to see God's people be the victors. He wanted to destroy the evangelism of the church. But did he win? The answer is no. Was a government like Rome, the persecutor, going to win? No. Verse 17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. And once you notice clearly who's going to be under the gun, he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Folks, who is that? When we read Revelation Who is it? Well, what have we been reading about? The beheaded who died because of their faith and their testimony. But also, who else has the privilege of keeping the commandments of God and having with that, connected to that, the testimony of Jesus Christ? It's Christians. When did Christianity start? First century. When did the kingdom come? When were we translated out of darkness into that kingdom? In the first century. Who was beheaded? Those who were faithful in the first century. And it was in the first century that we read about this devil being bound for a thousand years. But now we're back to the question. If the devil is bound, how is it that he still is at work? Why am I being tempted if the devil's in the abyss? What does bound then mean? Good question. What does the binding of Satan mean? What does Satan being bound for a thousand years mean? Well, here's how we're going to start to answer that question. It's to understand what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that Satan is powerless. 1 John 5, verse 19, We know that we are of God, John writes, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. New American Standard translates that, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Well, if Satan is bound, how is it we're in the sway of the wicked one? Well, it tells us that being bound doesn't mean that Satan is powerless. It also doesn't mean mean that we are free from an enemy. And Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 in that first century about that enemy. He tells us, and it lives on today, that with the same warning, we need to be so vigilant because your adversary, who's our adversary? The devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. What are we to do? Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Now, it would be easy to say and to make the argument, well, this was after, before Satan was bound, and so therefore we don't have to worry about an adversary. How many of you would raise your hand and say, I don't have an enemy spiritually anymore? I don't think too many of us would. I don't know about you, but I'm still watching out for him. Because he's seeking, and I don't want to be one that 
that sought. Also, this doesn't mean, we speak of the binding of Satan in Revelation chapter 20, that Satan is without influence. Paul writes to the Corinthians and warns them in verse 3 of chapter 4, but even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose, mind, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. And who are the blinded? Those who do not believe. Why don't they believe? Because they have been blinded from the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And the God of this world is still working to blind the, man, the, the, the world's minds by having the truth veiled. And how is one of the best ways he does that? By handing the world a lie. In fact, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, Spirit expressly says in the later times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. What are they doing? They're speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And look at the doctrines in verse 3 that we have identified. Number one, forbidding to marry. Number two, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. If you've studied Catholicism, Nacho, those were two important doctrines that they taught and still adhere to in, in, in many places and in, in many of their teaching and much of their teaching. Do we still have false teachers today in the world trying to lead us off in the wrong direction? Absolutely. It also, binding of Satan does not mean that we are free from liars. Because who are the liars, the false teachers? That's why in John 8, verse 44, Jesus says to those before him, you are of your father, the devil. Those must have been shocking words to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those scribes who thought they knew it all. For them to hear the words, you, of your, you are of your father, the devil, and desire of your father you want to do. And what was he? Well, he was that murderer from the beginning. What happened to Adam and Eve? They died because of their belief of his lie. And when he speaks a lie, Jesus says he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. I wonder if people ever stop and think, am I, am I listening to the lies of Satan or not? How many religious people in the world do you know ever stop and say, am I listening to Satan? Sometimes I have, people will say things and they'll, they'll reiterate a doctrine maybe that they have believed for a long time. And, and I'll ask him, if that is not from God, where did it come from? And usually I get a pause. Because how many people religiously want to admit that what they're believing is not true? We want to hold to the truth but not really question whether or not it is. And where are we going to find the truth? What do we depend on? The words of man? No, we know the, the words of this book give us the answer. That's why we need to read. Well, that brings us to this question. What does it mean? What does the binding of Satan mean? Well, I'm going to give you the answer. And then we're going to go a little further. Verse 3, look at that carefully. He cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal on him so that what? So that he should deceive the nations no more. Till a thousand years be finished. I can tell you definitely tonight when we look at this scripture, that the binding of Satan is about him not being able to deceive the nations. Now, here's the next question. What does deceiving the nations mean? Well, here's the good news. Part three, Lord willing, next Sunday night. So I want you to be back next Sunday evening and we're going to take a look 
at what does the Scriptures mean when it says that He should deceive the nations no more? Because clearly He was cast in the, that bottomless pit. He was bound so that He could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years be finished. So what does it mean when it says not deceive the nations? I'll give you something to think about, something to study, something to look on, and then next Lord's Day, Sunday evening, Lord willing, we will answer that question. And if you're a little bit disappointed that Satan's still able to influence and affect our lives, good. Because that means you'll be watching out for that roaring lion. But we want to know what the binding of Satan means according to Revelation chapter 20. In particular, what does it mean so that he should deceive the nations no more? Appreciate your attention tonight. This is what makes it all important. 1 John 3, verse 8. John wrote in that first century, He who sins is of the devil. That's why we need to remember he is that roaring lion. That he's the father of liars. And that he sinned from the beginning. But I'm thankful tonight because of all the blessings we have in Christ, including this one, for the purpose... For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil. Tonight, if you're here, the good news in Jesus Christ is that you can be in Christ. That you can have a remission of sins. That you can have the, what is necessary so that you can survive spiritually. And so tonight we're going to stand, we're going to sing an invitation song. And we appreciate Jensen's song leading, by the way, tonight. But as he sings and leads us in this song, think about your life. Seriously, as we stand and sing, would you come?
the Lord's table left prepare, prepare for those who don't have the opportunity to take the Lord's supper this morning. If you raise your hand, I will bring to you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be the name, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to use these brethren to partake of this bread that present that you sons by the hand of the cross. But they do this, big with them as they do this in the mind of pleasing your side. Yes, I pray to Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Prayer. Once again, Father, we come in our prayers to thank you for so many blessings you give us. Father, now we pray to you with this brethren that partake of this cup that represent the blood that Jesus shed in the cross on our behalf. Be with them, Father, help them to do this in my place in your sight. As I pray to your precious and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Did I don't look at anybody? Now we have the other commandment, which is the offering to the convenience, the time we'll do at this time. Let us pray. One more time, Father, we come into your presence, thanking you for so many blessings you gave us, for the gift of your Son, the plan of salvation that He brings to us, Father. We thank you for our homes, our family, our works, the means to do our living. And we know that you love the cheerful heart, Father, that be with these brothers that they have the offering to you during my place in your side. Yes, I pray to Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
couple announcements we have uh, to uh, convey to everyone. Jerry Letterman is with us tonight, sitting over there. No one recognized him. Uh, we'll be having a heart cath on Thursday, last time he had one. They put uh, stents in and they had to shock his heart to restart it. So let's pray for Jerry. He's our brother. And we love him. And Jerry, it's good to see you sitting there in your seat tonight. Uh, we have a uh, opportunity for all the jail ministry to be on a one-call list. So if you have not got on that list yet, see Danny Hyder and give him your phone number. Is that right, Brother Hyder? Yes, news to you? Okay. <laughs> And we'll be put on one call. So uh, sometimes we need to know uh, things about the work over there. And so, and we have a card from uh, Gordon uh, Perserpi and uh, from the Ozark Correction Center. So I think Randy is this one of the fellows we worked with. Yes. Okay, we did. Okay, it's a nice card and. Uh, Enjoy this wonderful season of grateful hearts, giving thanks as you celebrate the Lord's great goodness and love. Blessings at Thanksgiving. Wishing each and every one of you a wonderful Thanksgiving. You are a beacon of light and a blessing to everyone around you. I'm very grateful to have you in my life and very proud to be a part of your family. God bless you, Brendan Giuseppe. So I'm going to put this card out on the board, and I thought you, brethren, would enjoy hearing that. And one other thing is we, Ron and I, were in our pod this afternoon uh, visiting with those fellows. They were, we were talking about them, how to uh, assimilate back into society and to help other people as part of the Christian call. And if you see a brother in the ditch, I said, you know, you need to go and help him get up or call somebody and tell him that this man is there. And so this man spoke up and he said, is you, do you go to church down there on a highway on that new building? And he might have been talking about a new building over here. I don't know. But he said, I was in the ditch. And he said, I was covered in blood, passed out over there and said, somebody came in over there, came out, and woke me up and asked me if I was all right, gave me a ride over to Fordland and talked to me on the way over. And I don't know who that might have been, but if it was one of you brethren, that's, that's being a, a Christian, and that's doing the Christian walk. And that made me proud to hear that man say it, that somebody took the time and the interest to go aside and to help that man. Now, he's a Christian now. You might be interested to know. He's a Christian. There's no other announcements then? Okay, he sent this card out, Seth. Yeah, so Daniel Johnson sent the text for the jail ministry so that we could get on that. Ah, I see. Daniel Johnson. Not Daniel Hyder. But Daniel Hyder said he could do it. So. Oh, he could do it. Yeah. Okay. Daniel All right. All right. Uh, I stand corrected. Thank you, Brother Ron. Nothing else. Number 957. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Would you all please bow with me? Our most glorious, kind, and loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this day you blessed us with. And we think about the individual that was baptized at the jail today. What a blessing. And we think about all those young men and women that are in there struggling to put their lives back together. And we pray you would guide us in that effort. And thank you for allowing us to be a part of that jail ministry. We also pray this day, dear Lord, for all the ones here in the congregation that are struggling health-wise. We know you know their needs. And we lay that burden on you and know that if it's your will, it will be done. But even more, dear Lord, we think about the ones that have fallen away or that are spiritually sick that need to be back in your fold. And we pray you'd help us reach out to each and every one of those individuals. to let them know how much the family misses them and how much they need to be a part of this family. Thank you for those blessings of answered prayers. Thank you for all that you do for us every day. And as we go forth this week with that small, uh, smile on our face and that love in our heart, let us truly be a witness of how much Jesus means in our lives. May all glory and honor be yours in all our talents, in all our deeds. Forgive us of our sins. And it's in your precious Son's name we pray. Amen.